Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mass Appeal with Kansas City T-Bones manager John Massarelli. Mass Appeal is a weekly program that gives you, the fans, the opportunity to ask the Kansas City manager questions about the T-Bones, baseball or sports in general, or just seek John's wisdom about life events that are going on. In this week's episode, John explains why he's happy to answer questions on this show and not answer the questions of his interns. He explains the qualities that he's looking for his players to have. And is there such a thing as a father being too competitive with his kids? Let's find out on Mass Appeal. So let us welcome back manager John Massarelli. John, let's first of all start with your team updates for us. Um, well, first of all, we made a trade last week with uh, bringing Josh Hodges over for Brandon Tierney. Uh, just one of those pure baseball trades. Uh, losing, we were losing Josh Tolls for the... the WBC qualifier in Amsterdam with Team Australia, so we needed a starting pitcher uh, and made a deal to get Josh Hodges. And uh, He had two great starts this week, and I believe he's going to get named uh, Association Pitcher of the Week. So it's a good trade for both teams. Well, you got to like a trade with, that produces that kind of results right off the bat. Well, it did. It, it, I mean, he's made a nice impact uh, for us, and hopefully that will continue the last uh, half of the season. Excellent. Well, let us head on to this week's fan questions for you. We first of all begin with Mike from Kansas City. He says, every team in the Central seems to have had a winning streak of some kind. Isn't it time the T-Bones get their turn? <laughs> I'm all for that. Uh, I, mean, I guess that's the positive. We're, as we've been battling through uh, the first mm -hmm. half of the season, getting through injuries, getting guys healthy, uh, and we're still within – in first place, within first place, six and a half, seven games. And we haven't had, we haven't won more than two games at once. We haven't swept anyone. Uh, and I know this team's too talented not to go on a streak. So, I mean, that's the positive I see. Is we we turn the corner, uh, you know, I'm thinking our best baseball is ahead of us and where we can reel off uh, 15 or 20 and uh, uh, seeing us sitting at the top of the division. I know one of the things you were talking about in the show earlier on was the health of your team. Are you starting to see guys are getting healthy for you now? We yeah, had Tyson Gilly is starting to get healthy and swing the bat. Um, Sean Fernie is still a couple days from getting off. The, well, we can activate him in a week or two. Uh, Nate Tenbrink is going to get activated tomorrow. We're hoping he's back to 100%. Uh, so, yeah, the, the team in the lineup we've envisioned uh, all off season. I'm hoping uh, we can get together uh, for a good 40 game stretch and uh, see what we can do. That's what we like to hear. Next up, we have Rod from Kansas City. He says it's about halfway through the season, so he's wondering how you feel about your team right now. Well, I feel uh, very positive about it. I think uh, uh, the addition of Kickham and Hodges in the rotation, uh, and then Sean Fernie coming back. You put. Kick them, Cooper and Hodges, one, two, three. I think it matches up with any one, two, three in the league. And so if we see that rotation turn over two, three times, uh, we hopefully that's going to get us down the stretch uh, a good streak, like I mentioned, and along with our bats getting healthy. Uh, I rather like where we're sitting. Claire from Kansas City points out that she sees a lot of teams in the American Association who are stealing a lot of bases. Do you think your team needs to run more? Um. I think we steal bases. I don't. I haven't really checked our stolen base stats, but uh, you know, I don't know. Massey's been running. Uh, uh, I give guys a green light to run. Uh, I'm not a huge believer, in, and this is coming from a guy who stole a lot of bases in my, as a player. Uh, not a huge believer in the steal as a, an effective weapon to score runs. It's to me, it's more first to third using your speed or having the ability to score from first base on a double. Uh, but, you know, that's all part of the offensive plan, but uh, you know, I feel like we do steal a lot of bases. Next up, Big Sam from Kansas City would like to know, why is it that you will answer questions for this show, but when the interns ask you questions before games, you seem like you really don't like to answer them? <laughs> well, Big Sam, here's the situation. The questions on this forum come from knowledgeable baseball people. They're very, very good questions. Here's what happens to these poor interns. They go from being fans, and then they go to journalism school. <laughs> what happens is they take all the intelligence out of their questions. 
all the spontaneity, all the you know general knowledge of baseball, and they just start. I'll give you an example. You know, every single night, Big Sam and his intern staff ask me the same question: What so and so insert starting pitcher have to do to be successful tonight? Well, it's the same answer for 125 years. Why do they keep asking it? <laughs> you got to pitch to contact, throw strike, and get your ball to the manager in the seventh inning. Everybody knows that. But they go to journalism school, and that's the problem. <laughs> I love Big Sam. <laughs> Next, we have Bob from Kansas. He says, is it hard to find players when you are on the road and need someone to fill a spot? Where do you even look if you're in Laredo or Winnipeg, as examples? <laughs> Good question. Didn't go to journalism school with that question. <laughs> That's probably the hardest part of independent baseball in this job, whereas uh, if you're managing in double-A AA or triple-A an affiliate, you, you just call the call the big league club and they fly you guy in. <laughs> Here... It's hard enough when we're home. We keep names on our board of guys that we know about at all classifications, rookie, LS1, vet, whereas if a guy goes down with an injury, we, we're a phone call away. But when you get on the road, it's another issue, uh, whereas especially down in Laredo. We had that situation happen this year where Cole Leonida was hurt and had to play hurt. Uh, and Swingle, our other backup catcher, was down, and we had no catchers, and I was – on the phone for 24 hours trying to get a catcher to Laredo, Texas, and I couldn't do it. Uh, and Cole had to play her. Uh, like half, half his ability could barely hobble down to first. So it's a definite challenge in our league. Going back to the stolen base part, uh, Ben from Independence would like to know, do you let players pretty much have the green light in your team to steal bases? Uh, I do. I give them all the green light. Uh, and I tell them, depending on their speed, they need three things. They need to know the pitch, they need to have a lead, and they need to be able to get a jump. Uh, the faster you are, the less of those you need. If you're, if you're uh, Dalton Wheat, maybe you only need one of those. Uh, if you're Brian Erie, you definitely need all three of those equations if you're going to steal a base. Um, and then I'll watch them. If they get start getting below a, a 75 to 80% success rate, I may take the green light away. But I give my players the freedom to make plays and – you know, put us in good offensive situations. Is there any a time that w that a guy would have the green light taken away from them by you? Right. If they, if they're running into outs or uh, their success rate gets below seventy five percent, then I'll start to take it off. Or I'll tell them I'll put them on secret probation if they get thrown out one more time. The green light's taken away. That usually pulls the reins back a little bit. Next up, we have Adam, who has an interesting question. He says he hears lots of stories about how poorly some teams in the American Association are run. Do you think that hurts the perception of independent baseball? Uh, I don't think it hurts the perception from the fans because they're not as more – they don't see the internal uh, engine, so to speak, of how these some of these clubs run, but it hurts it amongst the players and the baseball people. They'll They'll know that – some poorly run organizations, and they kind of shy away from them. Um, we're very fortunate in Kansas City, where we get we get more contacts that want that want to play here than don't. Where there's other places in this league uh, that players and agents shy away from them, how they're treated as players. So we do a good job of that in Kansas City. At least we try to. You don't find then that if some clubs are not run well, that people just have a bad perception about Kansas City just because they're independent baseball and they perceive them in the same way they would look at another club, kind of. You talking about the players themselves? Yeah, like if the yeah, like if a player was coming from an affiliate club and and was kind of the independent baseball was out there. Are, do you find that they might be saying, well, I, I look at this one club that's not really run well, so maybe I just don't want to play independent baseball at all? Well, I think that there is that perception out there of uh, where maybe a certain player, it's just the network's so small in, in pro baseball where a player will get right you, a negative feedback from someone about independent, and then they'll just retire. I've had that happen Um where I've, we've contacted a guy and he just said, no, I don't want to, if I don't get signed, 
by an affiliate. I don't want to play independent ball. Uh, and you don't even go into details of why, uh, but it could very well be that they've run into someone else that had a bad experience. Ted from Olaf would like to know, is there part of the season where you start scoreboard watching to see how other teams in your division are doing? Uh, I tell my guys, you know, the last third of the season, you know, we get, uh, right now we're still in the middle grind. We're ending the middle part of the season. We just want to put blinders on and win one series at a time. But it puts you in a situation where the fun part of baseball is the last 30 games of uh, an independent season where, uh, you can score World Watch. You're looking, you know, series get bigger and bigger, and uh, games matter. So, and that's the fun part. You want to be in a position where your games matter late. Heading to a little MLB, Larry from Emporia would like to know: Did you think anyone was snubbed in this year's Major League Baseball All Star Game? You know what? I didn't pay close enough attention to it. Uh, whether or not anybody got snubbed, uh, so I really can't answer that question very well. I didn't watch either, to be honest with you. So that's okay. Uh, Aaron, from- I was in, I was in Laredo, I was in Laredo, Texas during the All Star break. That's like the, another vortex of the universe. <laughs> Aaron from Topeka would like to know what are qualities you expect from a player who plays for you. Uh, you know, I have three team rules with the guys: be on time for work, play the game hard, and play the game right. Uh, and to me, that's kind of as a general type of philosophy of how I want the players to act. I want them to be professional. I want them to play the game the right way, uh, not selfishly. Uh, I want them to play it hard, play it hard for their own benefit because that's how the game's supposed to be played for the fans. Uh, so those are the qualities I you know, demand on the field. Barry from Kansas City asks, he would think it would be very hard to release guys from your team, especially the younger guys. Uh, it, it's hard whether they're young or old. That's probably the toughest part of uh, a management uh, is ending a guy's career uh, or moving it along. You know, it's whether their guy that's been around 15 years is just as tough. They understand a little more the business part, whereas the young guys, it's a little harder. Uh, but I mean, it, it, that's tough. There's nothing nothing easy about the. Uh, on a guy that uh, his dream may be over. It, do you find that it's even harder when it's a situation where your release could really be the end of somebody's career? It's kind of like the last shot for them? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard when it's, uh, you, know, you know it's the guy's last year or you know that nobody's going to pick him up, uh, but you have releases where they're just roster move releases. Uh and you know that they're going to get another job. Uh, you know, I've had that situation this year with uh, you know Robbie Kuzja and Casey Barnes, both guys that ended up in Lincoln. Uh, they didn't fit in our club, and I was close to them, and it was hard. Uh, but it was more of a business move from our end that I had to we had to move another direction, uh, and I knew they'd get another job. So those are tough in a sense because I'm close to those guys, but it's also I knew that they'd get another job, and I actually helped recommend to get them another job. Next up comes Kyle from Kansas City. He says, I am always interested in how managers use their closer. Like, is it always in the ninth inning when your team is ahead? How do you decide? Well, that's an interesting question uh, because everyone perceives it like the big leagues. You know, in the big leagues, closers are used in the ninth inning when they're leading. And I've just never had that philosophy in the minor leagues because we don't have as many off days as the big leagues. Uh, you can do that in the big leagues. You're off Monday and usually... Uh, Thursday, uh, or if not one the other. You barely play seven games in a row. Sometimes they do, but it's hard to use a closer when every night you're playing, and you may have four nights in a row or five nights in a row. Uh, to me, a closer uh, should get about 50 or 60 innings if he's one of your better starters in a 100-game season. A lot of these guys, they'll close a guy and only get 30 innings, and I always argue if he's one of your best arms, then – I want to get 30 more innings out of them, uh, maybe use them for two-inning stints. Uh, but I generally, as a philosophy, want three guys in my bullpen that I feel confident that I could close the game out with. Craig from Lawrence would like to know, everybody seems to be turning to these shifts against certain players. Do you believe in this? Not 100%, but, you know, we've used it. Uh, you know, just play some 
an example, Charlie Valario from Joplin, who's our spray chart show. He's you know almost a ninety five percent pull pull guy. We were shifting the field on him. Uh, so I I've really got to have evidence. Uh, a lot of times we'll go in and they'll shift on us where they haven't even seen some of our guys, and some of the guys aren't. You know, they'll shift on Tyler Massey, and Tyler Massey goes the other way well. Uh, so I always uh, laugh when I see that, but uh, I only do it when I when the matchup on the mound dictates that this guy's a dead pull, and then then we'll make shift the infield a little bit. Peter from Liberty would like to know, watching his son's traveling team, he didn't really re- understand why managers play the defense in for some situations and not for others. What determines this for you? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm conservative with my bringing the infield in. I don't like to do it. Uh, I'll never do it with the runner on second base. Uh, I'm always about limiting damage defensively. Uh, as a philosophy with my teams, I want them one run doesn't kill us, two runs compared to two runs. So I don't like playing the infield in. It limits your defense on the ability to go back on a pop up, it limits your range in the infield. Uh, but when I do play it in, it's determined by the speed of the runner at third and the speed of the runner at the plate. Uh, so, you know, if I feel like, you know, that guy can steal second real easy if I play the infield in, then I'm definitely not going to play the infield in unless it's late in the game. Hmm, that's very interesting. Zach from Dodge asks, are there other sports that you recommend that his son plays that would make him better at baseball? I think any of the team sports. Uh all three of the major ones are even, you know, the soccer, but I, you know, football, basketball, any team sports that build uh, a team concept can help you with baseball. Next up, we have Don from Kansas City. He says, I love that your camp shows boys and girls how to play the game much better. Have you ever thought about having camps a few times a year to show young dads who may not be have played the game in years or, or need to ha- learn how to help instruct their own kids better? Well, it's an interesting question because I had a, oh, I can't remember how long ago where I tried to get a, you know, they do the coaches clinics and that's, I wanted to bring in coaches from little leagues uh, weekly and do seminars. Uh, and they still do that in the winter with, with the, the coaches camps or the coaches clinics at national coaches clinics, but I wanted to do it like on an on a local basis, and I started started doing it, and it just never really took off. I didn't get the response that I thought it would, and kind of ended it from there, but I think it's a good idea. That's too bad, because I would have thought a lot of coaches would have thought that was a great way to improve their own coaching skills. You would think. I just never got the response for it. Hmm, that's too bad. Well, now we pull out the couches. Mass has a couple of uh, personal questions people have for him. The first one is Henry from Kansas City who says, My wife gets upset at me because she says I am too competitive when we have family board game night. Isn't it okay for me to push my kids to compete harder, or should I just let them win sometimes? (laughs) I don't think there's anything wrong with letting them compete. I just don't think you can. I believe competitiveness is more genetic. Um, some kids just aren't competitive. Some people just aren't competitive, and that's okay. Uh, and some are extremely competitive. Uh, and to me, the one, if they're extremely competitive, then they want they want to compete, and it's okay to beat them because they got to learn how to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I agree but with if that. If they're not real competitive, then I think it's okay to let them win and so they feel good about themselves. Chip from Kansas City says, Skipper, look, I'm looking for a great place to take my girlfriend for our one-year anniversary. Any suggestions for me? Check out the Broadway series in downtown Kansas City, the Unicorn Theater, uh, and take her to a, a play. She'll love that. Chicks dig that. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. Dig the theater. Our last question for this week comes from Irritated Dad. He says, Mass, I have a question for you that is something I don't really understand. My kid will run for an hour each day, lift weights for 30 or, four minutes, 30 or 40 minutes, and throws a football or baseball for an hour after hour each week. Yet when I ask him to get up and take out the garbage, he acts like he's a 95-year-old man. I don't get it. Do you? 
<laughs> Come on, Dad. Kids are the most narcissistic people on the planet. <laughs> He's doing all those other things because he wants to do them. <laughs> because they're for him. Taking out the garbage is for you. <laughs> That's what being a kid's all about, complaining about doing chores. I couldn't agree with you more. John, thanks for joining us this week. All right, Rob, thanks for having me. We want to thank Manager John Massarelli for joining us on Mass Appeal this week. If you have your own questions you'd like to ask the Kansas City T-Bones manager, please send them to us at askjohn at minorleaguesportsupport.com. That's askjohn at minorleaguesportsupport.com. Please have your questions to us by Thursday evening so we can give the skipper a little time to review them before we record the show. I'm Rob Panier, the managing editor of the Minor League Sports Report, and we'll see you next time on Mass Appeal.